So uh, welcome to, <laughs> to this um, singu the third uh, Singularity University evening this fall. I'm Hannes Sjöblad, I'm uh, ambassador for Singularity University in Sweden. It means that uh, I arrange events and just in general preach the SU gospel, which is uh, sort of preparing humanity for uh, accelerating technological change. So that's what we are about at Singularity University. And tonight we have the pleasure to uh, host Marcus Olsson. Uh, Marcus, you are an alumni from Singularity University graduate summer program this summer. Um, you've also worked for a number of years at uh, Nokia, which recently became Microsoft, it's particular with um, imaging and, and other high-tech development projects. And what are you going to share with us tonight, Marcus? Yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about the technological evolution. So um, I'm going to start off talking about different uh, changes that happens in the society uh, due to digitalization of uh, different industries. And then I'm going to give a basic briefing on, uh, or basic uh, explanation on exp uh, exponential and why that can be seen as a solution to see these changes. And then I'm going to talk about um, some specifics around camera development that I've been involved in and where you can see disruption in a very concrete way. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about future trends of uh, exciting types. Uh, and so my background is from uh, in mobile. So I've had, uh, like Hannah said, I've had six years in the mobile industry. And actually before that, I worked for Sony Ericsson as well. But uh, uh, that has given me a sort of a first-hand seat to the uh, disruption. Uh, mobile industry has disrupted a lot of industries like the navigation industry and the, also the, um, the uh, compact cameras industry. And uh, of course I've also had first-hand experience of seeing when a big company fails to sort of uh, act to or see disruption coming upon them. So. Uh, that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. And uh, first of all, I'd like to ask where, where are you all from? Are you in? This is Startup Hub, so I guess you're all from startups, or is there any specific <laughs> industries? Or? WWF? WWF? Great. <laughs> nice. Stuff. Oh, yeah. All right. Potential customer for our Singularity project. <laughs> all right. Anything else? Any medical? How many here is in medical? I know. Give us something. Yeah. Anyone in uh, music, media industry? There we go. Any other industries? Science. Science? Right. Chemistry. Great. Okay. Glad that you're here. So uh, let's get started. I was uh, this year, like Hannah said, I was at Singularity University. I think you might know about it already, so I won't go too deep into it. But essentially, it's a think tank and an incubator for big thoughts and uh, a network of thinkers. And uh, it's located in Silicon Valley. Some of uh, you might know. This guy over there, that's Virpal, who's sitting there, he was there in my same class. We were the Nordic delegation, so to say. And yeah, it's an exciting place. And uh, uh, my girlfriend was actually speculating of uh, if I would uh, come back from Singularity University as a robot. I've uploaded my brain and then uh, coming back as a robot. But I had to sadly disappoint her by just showing that the only thing that happened with me was that I gained some weight. <laughs> and, <laughs> but actually there was also other things. You, uh, in Singularity, you get very inspired and, and very excited and uh, you're uh, changing your way to see the world. So uh, they're teaching you to see, uh, think exponentially. And uh, that's a little bit of what I'm going to try to talk about today as well. Um, and a lot of us from SU comes out talking about like how robots will take over the world and artificial intelligence uh, solution to all problems and uh, and sort of space elevators and stuff like that. And those forecasts have been with us for quite a long time. So this is a book from 1944. It's the, the helicopters are coming. So at, not, already in 1944, they were believing that the helicopters would actually come. People would drive their own helicopter and go shopping in, in shoppers and so on. Well, if you're supposed to believe uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, so they are actually coming now, but actually not as personal vehicles. But the drone is a big, a big thing, of course. Drone delivery and, and so on. Pizza drone. Say again? Pizza drone. Pizza drone, yeah. yeah. I've seen there was a beer drone as well. Yeah, like, <laughs> they were you ignore it online. Found it on, 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 on through a swarm, I think. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Um, so they are coming, and the future is coming. Uh, it's just damn difficult to predict when it's going to come. 
Uh, and uh, this is a quote from Arthur C. Clarke that I find very suitable as well. Uh, if you find a prediction reasonable, then it's probably wrong, because the future is not reasonable. It is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it is about. So we think linear. We think that the future will change in a linear pace, but actually it's going faster than linear that I will show soon. Um, and uh, it can also uh, have a lot of impact on different businesses. These kind of changes that we see in society, if you're not uh, prepared for them, they might uh, come as a surprise and have uh, devastating consequences. Um, this is a quite famous example with Kodak. In 1996, they had 140,000 employees and a market cap on 28 billions. 16 years later, in 2012, uh, they were essentially bankruptcy. And that was because they failed to see the digitalization of film. That same year, in April that year, 2012, uh, Instagram was actually acquired by Facebook for uh, $1 billion. So 13 people employed by Instagram, and they managed to wipe out the whole industry. I mean, there were other parts as well. Facebook put, uh, played a part in it as well. But uh, essentially, like sharing of images, uh, the whole industry of photos has been digitalized. And that means that you can share them with no cost, and, and that means that the whole industry is tapping into this exponential growth. And uh, Spotify is another example. The music industry uh, was disrupted. I mean, that's stabilized now, but, but for a while there, there was like, oh, why can I, I can get it free online. Uh, and then sort of like, now Spotify has made a great, great business there, sort of the Instagram of music, I would say. And uh, this is an example recently from this summer, uh, Uber. So uh, these are demonstrations all over Europe for people are demonstrating for an app, an application. So they're actually going out, ban that app, ban that app, make, make Uber Ill illegal. So what, what's going on here? It's an app. So it's, it's, um, these are changes due to digitalization. And uh, one of the key, uh, key uh, things to understand this is exponential growth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about exponential growth now, right now. There is, um, this is a triangle. <laughs> And uh, if you divide that triangle in four triangles and uh, take out the middle one, you have three left. So you uh, triple the number of triangles. You do it again, you have nine. And you do it again, you have 27 now. And if you do that one more time, you have 81. So the number of triangles is increasing uh, exponentially. So you, you're uh, tripling every time. So this is called a Sierpinski triangle. And I have actually a 3D printed version of one here. It's pretty nice. Uh, it's a uh, sacred geometry. It's uh, been with us for many, many thousands of years. People have been drawing this on, I think, uh, some Indians way back. Uh, but that's besides the point. Uh, the point is that this is a fractal pattern, and it's a natural occurring thing. This is exponential. Uh, the number of triangles are tripling every time. So. The function of this is um, 3 to the power of x. And if you double things, uh, you have uh, f to the uh, 2 to the power of x. So this is, these are the functions for exponential growth. And if we plot that, so this is uh, to compare linear uh, growth versus exponential. The red line here, the colors are a little bit out of shape here, but uh, the, the red line here is um, essentially exponential. That's a doubling. It starts at 1, and then 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And uh, the uh, yellow line here uh, is a linear uh, growth uh, with 200 times. For every step, you're adding 200 to this. So as you see, it's, it's uh, sort of the exponential line here is quite deceptive in the beginning. It, it, nothing is really happening. It looks like it's not moving if you compare it to the linear growth. But then eventually, at step 11, here it compare, and then 12, it's double, and then 13, it's way beyond. And then it just takes off. So it's a bit like the, the ketchup effect. So your first nothing comes, first nothing comes, and then all of a sudden everything comes. Our brain is not really wired to think like this. That is the problem. Like We think that something is going to come on an even pace. The future is going to come evenly. But uh, actually it comes really, really fast when it comes. This is uh, one of the important fundamentals around uh, what they're teaching at Singularity University as well. And the knee here of the curve here, when it goes kind of goes uh, over the top, it's called an infliction point. So that's when the curve really takes off. Yeah. Can you ask questions? Yes. Okay.
in the environmental business, you would say this is a hockey stick. Hockey stick is yeah. uh, also. And also, it's a tipping point. A tipping point, yes. Yeah. So we have different uh, types different of terminology. Form, yeah. yeah, they're all, I guess, borrowed from different. This is another way of saying the hockey stick effect. Yeah. So how many here knows about uh, Moore's law? Quite a lot. All right. I'm going to go through it quite quickly anyway. So uh, half of you haven't. Uh, known about it, and, and let's let's go a little bit deeper and talk about that anyway. So first of all, the, the, there's um, a tendency here also I forgot to say of overestimation. So if you're having um, if you're having a technology coming on an exponential pace, you're in the beginning you're thinking that oh it's going to solve everything, it's going to be great, but then it actually doesn't deliver because it grows so slowly, and then eventually it will uh, over overwhelm you, sort of it will lead to chaos and am amazement, sort of. And this is a logarithmic plot, so. The plot here means that the exponential curve that you saw on the previous image, that would correspond to a linear straight line. So because it's the plots here are like, every step here is like 10 times bigger. And uh, that's just to make it easier to scale because you saw it grows out of the range, so you need to use a logarithmic uh, scale for it. And Moore's law is predicting that every two years, the amount of computing power you get for $1,000 is going to double. So around 18 months. That has been true for the last 40 years. And we don't know exactly why that's true. We do know that it correlates to exp uh, exponential and this mathematical phenomena of doubling. And it could be something that I'm, I'm suggesting that it is, when we're creating these chips, we're using tools like chips to do them. And then if you're getting better at doing it, you're iterating over what you just learned. So you're iterating over your own system, and that's very similar to the triangle that I just described. And what's very interesting here, what many people might not know, is that Moore's law is not the first uh, law. It's been true, if you go back in time, before the integrated circuit, that was the transistor. And uh, before the transistor, that was a vacuum tube. People would do calculations using vacuum tubes. So this is very early computing. That has been true for 110 years. So it's like, it looks like there's something deeper to it that, than just like the fact of that it's a marketing trend that they want to send more chips or so. So it seems like there's something fundamental going on in this. And as you see, the, the technology paradigm is changing. And it might even be so that after the integrated surface is outdated, that we have another kind of computer that could be, a, could be an optical computer or it could be a DNA computer, for what I know or a quantum computer that we were, they have one at, at NASA actually, but they're, they're not there yet, but it's, it's, it's uh, possible that it might come another paradigm and keep on driving this force. So, and, and this is the point that I want to make also, that exponential growth is something that is a phenomenon in nature also, like it's, it's wider than just computation. And that's uh, what has been driving our evolution up until this point. So if you look at evolution, it starts with uh, when life came to planet, we had uh, proteins and genes, they were developing information and more and more complex structures. So uh, the natural selection makes one gene go further and uh, chromosomes are, are iterating and uh, you, you have cells uh, which consist of chromosomes, which consist of proteins. So you have kind of system built on system built on system, just like with this uh, Sierpinski triangle. And when you're iterating that every time, you have uh, more and more bigger complexity. So it's, it's like a Evolution is a force in nature that strives towards more and more complex systems. So in the end you have a multi-cell organism, and then you have a, uh, a super organism like a colony of ants, like an ant hill, and then a primate society where you can uh, have the evolution act on a whole group of individuals, right? So the fact here, when, it, when, it shifts, when evolution shifts between these uh, different stages, it never goes back. It's always, evolution always goes towards more complexity and more and more bigger structures and more complex information. And uh, that's very similar to how, what Kevin Kelly describes in his book, uh, What Technology Wants. He, he describes something called a technium, which is essentially all the um, technology that we have created on, on this planet. So it goes beyond like cameras and stuff. It's like, uh, it could be language, it could be things like tools, like for cooking or, or things like that. So the technium is a wider scope. And the evolution of this is, is also following the same pattern. You're creating oral language. That was the biggest thing that for 50,000 years ago what defined us as humans, more or less, that we started communicating with each other. And then you have this oral language. You're iterating this with a uh, written language, which makes it more powerful. You can memorize longer. You can create information that lasts longer. And you can transport it over longer distances. So ever more complex uh, structures, like printed language. You have scientific method where you can reference to different points of information. 
mass production to scale things. And then right now we're in this phase where it's like global communication, where we're in one planet connected with mobile phones and internet, and where we can actually iterate over a whole society. And that is really powerful. That is something that we see big effects of that. And, and it's, it's following the same laws as the exponential growth. Any questions on that? That was a little bit of theory around that. What's the next step? What's the next step? Yeah, it's, this is not the final step. Uh, the communication, this is the most complex form of uh, iteration of information right now. But uh, the next steps, I don't know, like artificial intelligence will be very interesting, like evolution of artificial intelligence. Like you already have that, look at games. Like you have these player bots, like you have these kind of to breed different player bots. You put them in one server and then they breed. <laughs> And then it's like evolving information, and then the best competitor in this gaming hub will win, and that, that player, like uh, these player bots, like artificial intelligence is in games. So that's kind of an interesting like evolution that happens on like artificial uh, information structures. And genetic programming, like you have already uh, genetically algorithms like for programming that you can evolve them and make different algorithms compete with each other. So, yes? What about? Politics, I mean, they kind of hinder or try to stop the, the global communication. Mm. So how do you work around that? I mean, that's a power shift thing. I mean, how do you, how do you make them not stop you? Yeah, this is what um, is super important. The channeling of this, this is a power, right? Evolution is a power. And it kind of um, evolves, um, just like the technium evolves, right? But it's, it's um, just like natural selection, uh, it's uh, defined by different certain constraints. So in evolution, like with um, how we became humans, uh, evolution says that, yeah, certain conditions like the, and the certain kind of temperatures and certain conditions made us what we are, right? You can create that on technium as well. You have to create the boundaries, like uh, by a legal system, I believe, a legal system, and you can also influence it by building uh, structure, technical structures built into the network. Like Twitter is very sort of decentralized in a way, even though it's like owned by a company and, and so it's still kind of hard to stop it because it's like you can't really censor it in the same way as you could with, with other more centralized systems. So like if you take things down, the linkage would break. So it's built into the fabric of this technology. So you can, you can do it by building technology, like open source is a great example. Uh, which is hard to stop, very hard to stop, and then you can do drive regulations, so technology will develop, develop in, a, in the right way, and that's, that requires a lot of understanding, like that's why sort of this file sharing uh, thing was very complicated, right? It's, you had to have legal, uh, like lawyers understanding the technology on a very, very deep level to make the real regulations and so on, and it's really complicated, and I think that's what uh, also Singularity teaches us, like, Understanding the technologies is super important because it's going to define how, like, think of, think of an artificial intelligence. Like, if you drive an artificial intelligence as an open source versus having it as a company owned, you'd have completely different uh, impact on it. Like, how does it diagnose uh, things and etc. So, so these are, these are important. Like, regulation, I think, is because technology acts in a certain way through the same laws as we act, in a way. I have a just response to that. Actually, like you know, I, I study a lot of political science, and that's a very interesting question because we talk about it a lot. But the thing is that uh, regulatory and legislation states are always adaptable to human and technological advances. So, as you see, like if you look at Harvey or whatever, you always see that the technology is coming first, and then the legislations are coming afterwards. So they will never be able to match up with the speed of the legislation towards the technology. So we will always be afterwards, like, uh, retain that afterwards. Unless we pioneer, like, yeah, unless but we then, go but that's, that's from a good, the front. That's a good one, and think, yeah. because when the pioneers then come, then you, you build the structures just besides them all the time. Yeah. So it will still be around the system, and not in the system. So, yeah. Hmm. All right. So, this is a, uh, an image that I really like, uh, which I think uh, describes uh, this situation we're in and these changes that we're in right now. This is a uh, Hokusai, uh, old Japanese footprint that uh, has turned gone digital, so the great wave. This is a, essentially a framework that I want to talk about to think about these disruptive technologies. It's the uh, six Ds of Peter Diamandis coined these terms. So uh, how a technology goes through from digitalization, becoming deceptive, disruptive, it starts dematerialize and demonetize and democratize. So I'll go through these now. So digitalization is pretty obvious. We already talked about it, how Kodak became outdated by uh, not responding to the digitalization of a film 
analog film. You have video cassettes. Uh, like I actually saw a store in Finland the other day. Now when I was walking, they were actually selling VHS cassettes. <laughs> they were only open on Sundays between two and four or something. <laughs> I think it's money laundering, probably. <laughs> but yeah, so a newspaper also like the paper industry is affected quite a lot by not having enough sales on on paper. Books, obviously, CD industry was already digital, but like it's become streaming now, so it's not a physical object anymore. Uh, and now journals as well, like digital system of uh, healthcare is a, is a really big deal. So what happens when it turns uh, digital, when industries become digital, it's like they're tapping into the Moore's law that you saw. It becomes uh, cheap to distribute. Uh, you can uh, distribute innovation. You can have one uh, developer doing a code that spreads all over the planet. So that's why these big changes are occurring. And transferring that it's free, right? And uh, yeah, healthcare. I already talked about that. So if you think about the, the sort of all the wearables, like the watch now from from like we we just launched a watch at, watch at Microsoft. We're measuring. Uh, you can measure different uh, things on your body, right? So healthcare become digitalized. Now all of a sudden you have uh, data of how your body works. So that's digitalized, and then you can do completely different things. DNA sequences in, a, in a, another example. Like we can sequence our genes and get completely new kind of research on, on, on our genes. Next step is why is it deceptive? Like why don't we see it? Why don't every industry understand this? Why, why, why can't we just say, well, we know that that's going to come, so now we're going to invent this. So if you look at this uh, plot here of performance versus time, so performance goes up on each technology and also the consumer's need for technology goes up. So you have a high-end user is a little bit more need than a low-end user. So it means that uh, maybe someone that is really like into cameras, he, he's up here, right? In using the camera technology and, and the low-end user is <coughs> down here. He, he doesn't need so many megapixels, he doesn't need so much uh, good quality. But uh, traditional technology development has been like, sustain it's called sustaining innovations. Uh, they're uh, widespread, they're existing already. It goes up all the time, it's a small step, like a little bit bigger screen, a little better like, power, longer battery life, and etc. right? And what's happening is that a traditional business is like camera business, for example, like think Nikon or, or Canon. They, they think like uh, every user wants to have this better, more, and, 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 and sort of like they, they want this form factor, we're going to sell that, that's what customer wants, that's what reviewers are, are reviewing, and, and, and so, but then all of a sudden something disruptive comes, like a completely different, different shift, like the mobile phone uh, with a built-in camera. So, uh, Canon and Nikon could not really respond to that because they didn't do phones, right? So uh, then it comes here, first it's down here, and I'm going to show some examples on this uh, later. Uh, it goes here and no one really thinks it takes it for, for free. Do you remember the first camera that came from Ericsson? Like, it was snapped on through the, through the... It was like an external camera that you snapped to your mobile phone. Before the phones had cameras, so you snapped it on and then you could take pictures. But no one really wanted those. But, like, they were down here, right? And then it becomes here, when it touches the low end, it becomes uh, interesting and people can start using it. It's cheaper, it's there for free, I can have it, and then it just goes, goes, uh, goes disruptive. And it's, this is kind of the good enough point. Like, if the technology is good enough and then it's gonna, and then it's too late to switch. Like, because then someone else is doing that, right? And electric car is another example. Like, why haven't the traditional car industry developed electric cars? Because they're, it's gonna completely disrupt their own business. So, it's like, um, and now you have Tesla with 400 kilometers range and you charge it every once a week and then it drives in 110 more than that. So it's, it's actually good enough. I mean, and then this is a, a quote that I think is it's important. Like true disruption means threatening your existing product line and your past investments. Breakthrough products disrupt current lines of business. And that's why, that's why it's very challenging for big companies to do disruptive, disruption. And that, that is now a trend that I've been working at Nokia with uh, business incubation. So you have, you're setting up a small startup. You're, you're probably already knows about this, but big companies are working in a quite different way. So the, 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 the small startup can innovate much faster. And if you put that outside of the big company, you can actually do disruption inside a big company as well, like intrapreneurs. So if we go back to this now, so that's why it's uh, deceptive and, and disruptive we talked about. So, uh, dematerialize. So this is kind of like in 2010. Uh, to uh, Tonton had this personal navigation device that you had in the car. And um, in 2010 that was actually, in the mobile phones didn't have turn-by-turn -turn navigation. So it wasn't for free. Uh, because it was, the mobile phones were not good enough. They didn't have the screen 
and they didn't have the power, they were not there. They didn't even have GPS at the time. They did have GPS, but that was just coming. And what we did in 2010 in, in Nokia Maps was that we made it for free on uh, the mobile. <coughs> and that's completely set uh, the bar to Garmin and TomTom. Uh, the, the sort of the stocks went down dramatically. And okay, some people are still using using navigation. They they like to have a permanent like thing, but but of course there, there's like this disruption. It's like it's a little bit smaller and it's like not so perfect, but you can have it as a stand. You can actually work with it. So this is this is a typical significant for for a disruption. Like the the screen were just good enough, and the data came, and then you have extra services, and, and so and that disrupted the the personal navigation devices. Demonetization, like that means that uh, exponential technology takes the money out of things. Think about um, Skype. Why would you pay for international calls when you can get them for free, right? So you go online and, and you just call for free. So it's very hard for operators right now to charge for international telephone calls. And the same thing is now, I think, going to happen with uh, Bitcoin. Now, obviously, Bitcoin brings money into sort of the system, but the banks have traditionally done the bank transfers from country to country, right? But with Bitcoin, you can now transfer from country to country with almost no fees, right? So it takes the money out of these kind of services because why would you pay for it? I can get it on using Bitcoin. I mean, it's not a quite dear. I, I, not many people are using it yet, but I guess like it's coming quite rapidly. It's... There, you can even incorporate com uh, companies on digital currencies. Now the Swarm is doing that. Like the, the stock in itself, like stock exchange, is going to be kind of uh, interesting to see what happens with that when you're incorporating on a digital currency instead of incorporating on a stock so, like, these, these are big changes ahead. Who is um, doing that? Say again? Who is doing that? Uh, I think there's a, there's a company called uh, Swarm. It's a co-founding mechanism on a digital currency. So you can co-found co something uh, on a digital currency. And I also heard that there's talk about Reddit going on, uh, Reddit going public on a digital currency. Like the, is that in Sweden, the Swarm company? No, the Swarm is in uh, Palo Alto. Yeah, in Silicon Valley. Uh, and it's a kind of a response to Kickstarter where you had co-founding, but the people who co-founded didn't get anything in the company, right? So Oculus Rift being the famous example when they, every backer paid a lot of money for these first sets and backed them early and gave them the money to, to develop it. And then all of a sudden Mark Zuckerberg came and just snapped them up. And then like the people who bought the first uh, Oculus Rift didn't actually get the uh, units until the HD version was out, so they got kind of pissed, and then. so now co-founding uh, is going to happen probably on digital currencies, and so on. like that's something coming at least. So the last one is to democratize. Uh, so it also has the power of democratize. This is a picture from uh, demonstrations to in China for the tear gas in, in Hong Kong. They're using the phone here just to show that we have the power, right? So it's a it's a power symbol. The mobile phone is now. Uh, saying that the power structure is, is gone because we can call, we can do, we can coordinate like uh, Arab Spring was also kind of a, also coordinated digitally and, and, and uh, actually Ray Kurzweil, he forecasted the, the fall of Soviet Union already due to the emergence of fax machines and cellular phones. So uh, he did that ahead because he looked at the exponential curve and said these technologies are going to come and, and that technology will impact the society. Obviously you can regulate the way things like North Korea is still not uh, democratized, but because they don't have technology there, like they've banned it. So you can actually do that, but it's like very hard to sustain when you have this technology, the technium working against you, right? So uh, I want to look at the uh, like show an example now of uh, of how this looks like in, in real life, like a, my first hand example. So do you have any questions so far? Okay. So the um, first compact camera I had was in 1998. It's an Olympus. It had a standard quality on 320 pixels times 240, it sounds like ridiculous when you think about it, but uh, it also had a high quality mode, which was 640 for 80. So that's like 0.3 megapixels, insane. But it was like, it was digital, so it was cool, I, uh, that's why I bought it. And then in 2001, just after that, like a, a few years, three years later, you had, uh, you could take pictures that were decent quality, like this is, uh, now the projector is actually, hard to show a resolution on, on this projector, but, but I think this projector is still kind of VGA or, or, or so. But, but uh, the, uh, the quality here in 2001 was uh, 2 megapixels. It's, it's decent enough. I used that for a long time. And then in 2003, I got my first phone with a camera, built-in camera, the T610. Uh, and I took this picture of my mother in 0 to 1 megapixel. And I thought, like, yeah, it's 
a decent picture, but nothing you could print. You can really like sort of like I took it because I was, I was a tech nerd, right? Uh, and I didn't have anything else to take. I didn't have my camera with me. So now we are essentially now we are here. So this is in 2003, somewhere here. Right? This, uh, this disruption here with the mobile phone is coming, overtaking the traditional compact camera. Uh, and if you look at the plot of, I plotted the, the this is also logarithmic plot. So this is the compact camera here, my first one, a zero three, and here's the first mobile phone, <coughs> and they're working here, like coming in, in parallel here, and then somewhere around here, 2009, something happened. I think people started using that. That's the K800 from Sony Ericsson, which really started to be sort of decent quality. This is like, um, uh, I started using that at holidays. <coughs> and then in 2011, then it was really like, now it's, we're up on 12 megapixel, and I don't need a compact camera, really. Now, now it's really, really good quality. So, I don't know, when did you change? When, when did you start using mobile phones as your primary cameras? Do you remember? Or? 2010. 10? Yeah, it's somewhere around there. Right? The iPhone. iPhone, yeah. So around there, now in 2013, of course I have to do some marketing here for our beautiful <laughs> phone. So I, I was part of, I was program manager for this phone, a 41 megapixel camera. Um, VP Review actually compared the 1020 with the, uh, found that it's on pair with a digital SLR, which is three years old. So like we're catching up so much that the phones, the quality of the phone cameras are on pair with the camera, digital as well, for 2,000 euros, three years old. So that's disruption, that's the resolution. That's your sister, by the way. In Italy. And the flowers shouldn't be really be that green, they should be red. So something is <laughs> fishy. It's not due to the camera, I promise. <laughs> But so the, uh, here I plotted also the digital SLRs here, increasingly steady, steady, steady going up. That's a little bit different business here. Uh, but you can see that's due to Moore's law as well, like the, the digital SLRs are also increasing here. But eventually, mobile phones are almost overtaking. I mean, obviously with the digital SLR you get better lenses and, and you get, and get other things, so you can't really compare them. But, but sensor-wise, the, the, they are really there now. And also the, the, Actually, this corresponds pretty well with the sales figure for, for sort of, if you look at the sales figures for, for compact cameras, they really dropped and, and that business is pretty much gone now. Around 2011, they were started to fall down very dramatically all over the world. Um, but yeah, so now I'm going to go in and talk about the future, some trends uh, of what I believe is going to come in, in the future. So uh, global connectivity is a big theme. One billion people will come online in the next coming six years. And it's, all due to smartphones. So um, this is a graph showing that right now we have three billion people online, and two out of three has a smartphone, which is online. But in six years, all of them will be online due to mobile phones, because so many smartphones will be sold. So we will have four billion people with, with smartphones. And this is a big thing, because like the, what I talked about before, that you're iterating on a whole society and a whole planet, right? So, the, this is not just an incremental increase. Like it's not just like twice as many people going online. It's like a whole, it's a whole new country is coming online, and, and it's like uh, very, very many new services can be built there, and new kind of systems. Uh, and uh, this is a great uh, opportunity for them to leapfrog the whole internet era and go straight to the fully connected society. A CPU power, like I showed before, the the the, uh, the Moore's law. This is a prediction um, that you can see, like this, this red line here, which is supposed to be red. Uh, it's uh, the power of desktop from 2013. That's how many gigahertz you can do in heterogeneous computing. So it's like how fast the computer is, essentially. And you can see in, in 2015, around here now, next year, you're going to have game consoles uh, approaching that same. So you can do the same thing on your TV as you could do on your desktop. And then in 2018, you have a smartphone and, and tablet. Like in four or five years, the smartphone and tablet will have the same power as we have right now on our desktops. And then what's interesting is here the, the, the future wearable. If you just interpolate and look at the uh, exponential curve, the wearables will be sort of in just 10 years, uh, they might have the same power as we have on our desktop. So it could be that you're walking around with your PC on, on, your, on your wrist or, or in your glasses or, or, or something like that in just 10 years. So it's really applicable, like you could use this thinking and, um, what's that? Or you want to have it I'm inside? Just, or... I'm just jubilating over this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were just discussing whether it would be as a wearable or inside the Inside the body, yeah. On, on my eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That could be like lenses, augmented reality with lenses. That's pretty cool. Um, this is an example of the sort of like we just Intel just released this USB flash drive that runs Windows 8.1. So it's like you can already run it on, on this size, the, the desktop. So reality, that's where the pizza guy comes from, isn't it? <laughs> saw a guy with a t-shirt that said that once on a hacker event. Um, uh, <laughs> reality, that's where the pizza guy comes from. It's like, <laughs> kind of scary. So, but, um, but think about uh, what I said about good, good enough, right? Right now, if you put on a pair of uh, Oculus Rift, you will think that it's kind of like uh, HD quality now and, and, and so, but if you think of the, the curve rising, then the more sensors will be added, audio interface and, and things like that, it might become reality soon. And, and it might be so that you think like, why? Yeah, well, it's okay, it's like reality. And uh, even though I think this is pretty interesting as well, like I just, this was actually released today. I mean, yeah, the, the Samsung just released this three, 360 camera that, that are, uh, it's Project Beyond, it's called. <coughs> It was just on the news today. The, the, they are streaming it to their virtual reality gear. So you have a kind of a camera that takes 360, and then you can relive it with your with your uh, goggles. It's a, it's pretty cool. You can actually then just go around from place to place and just look around, right? You more or less just travel, and you can zoom in and zoom out and move around in it. And it's going to be maybe pretty cool. I don't know. That, this is just a, a trend. I don't know. Samsung doesn't really convince me when it comes to image quality, though. So I think and product <laughs> product wise, they suck. <laughs> Anyway, but so maybe not everybody wants to sit with a face sucker on your face. So like you might want to have something that you can kind of socialize with. So augmented reality is super interesting. They, they, they look kind of funky still, but think about the exponential curve. They're going to be smaller and they're going to be nimble. These are uh, a company called Meta, uh, Space Glasses they're called. They have a display inside of them uh, which projects things and they have a Kinect sensor so they can sense where your hands are. So you project things that are in three dimensions and then you can interact them. So you can grab things and drag them and I can kind of take this photo, send it to you and I can do that. I, I, you can interact with it. So, and still you can have a conversation with your between four eyes. Like this is a picture of a uh, game of chess. They're playing a game of chess there on a virtual chess board. So the whole world are now kind of your display. There's also quite interesting stuff coming with Magic Leap. This is a small company. Uh, that is uh, the only thing they have uh, as a product is essentially this video of an elephant and it's kind of silly because they're like being founded by Google now for 500 million so they're more or less entering the, the unicorn club uh, which means like they don't have a product but they're like so what they're speculating about is that this is um, retina projection so you have a system that projects straight into your eyes and uh, it means that you'd be able to walk around and just Similar to the meta uh, like things, but but of course better and, and like not so intrusive or so. Like if you'd have eye tracking as well, you could kind of if you look around and then you can see different things. So pretty trippy stuff. <laughs> uh, but it it would be in a whole different new kind of gaming and and a whole new I mean computing as well. Like think augmented reality. Why would you need a display? Like you could just hold up your hand and read the text from your hand, right? So it's like everything changes. Like this is what's going to disrupt the mobile industry, I believe. Our virtual reality as well. Excuse Yep. Sure. So, if two people are engaged in an activity, yeah. the third person in the same glass, so you'll be able to see it? No. You see nothing. nothing. So, it's a little bit like people walking around with headsets today and talking. So, people would sit and just like this. And what game are they playing? Chess or. <laughs> so, you wouldn't see it, no. Uh, and that's kind of pretty cool for a business as well, like if you have security, privacy issues, you don't need to project it like on a screen and someone outside of the window can see it. You could just have the whiteboard here and then you have glasses on and then you see what you see with everybody wearing those glasses and sharing the information. Or maybe you don't share the information, maybe my graph is better than someone else's graph, you could show different things. <laughs> it, it completely renders what reality is, like you'd have to ask what kind of reality are you looking at? So. What's projected outside is still, still in the visible spectrum. Uh, these glasses are just displays. So these are prototypes right now. Meta glasses exist, I've tried them. And they are using just display technology, like LCD displays. And then also they're using it to catch the interaction, they're using like uh, Kinect. Do you understand? Oh. You have to try them. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, but if the chess players would deliberately want to invite a third party, uh, yeah. is that, uh, is that uh, possible? That's probably a good space to go into as a startup. Yeah. Now the access uh, management and shared space, I mean, you have to kind of log into kind of a, like Second Life or like some kind of shared virtual world, right? So you have to have some kind of then sharing things like Facebook by bought Oculus, so I think that's why they want to build this kind of shared space of information. I like this information sharing is then going to be like, but you need to have the glasses, so yeah. A few of the spaces that Matt I do want to get into is, is uh, medical, so in terms of surgery. So if you're training somebody or you're getting feedback from somebody who's seen the surgery being carried out, that okay, you should do this and this instead. So that's one of the spaces that Matt has. Uh, and, and what they want to do is basically create a, like everyone else, create a platform where others can produce apps and, and yeah. basically allow others to use that hardware for different types of applications. One of them is the medical field so that you can actually share that and get feedback continuously from another surgeon or a professional who's giving you feedback in a complicated. Yep. What's the difference between this and Google Glass? These are much uh, higher resolution and uh, the Google Glass, if you try them, they're essentially just a little information. They're not, you can't interact with it uh, except touching on the glass. Uh, ah. This is sort of, you have, a, you have a, a glass which also sees where you are, so it can combine uh, your gesture, <coughs> so you can grab things. Ah. You can kind of take the thing and move it, and, and uh, so. But yeah, it's it's the evolution of Google Glass. But Google Glass was more like a research project, I guess. So, like, and it was quite low resolution, and and, and, and so. And it, Google Glass also films, which is kind of annoying <coughs> if you're sort of privacy sensitive. So, hello, Dave. <laughs> this uh, for you, those of you who have seen uh, 2001: uh, Space Odyssey. This is kind of the artificial intelligence in in, in the movie. It uh, was made in 1968, so all the time since that we've been going on thinking that these artificial intelligences, that's the new thing, it's gonna be like talking to a human and it's gonna say, I'm afraid I can't let you do that, Dave. <laughs> and it's gonna be super scary, right? <laughs> uh, but, um, so uh, this is kind of the, 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 the legacy of this AI and, and uh, artificial intelligence, this kind of conscious AI is called now strong AI. That's the term that we're using right now. Strong artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence. That's when this kind of uh, consciousness becomes sort of like, and, and the films like Transcendence doesn't really do it better. People are scared about it, of course. But, but so I think AI, when I'm talking about AI, I'm gonna talk about um, smartness, artificial smartness. There was a super interesting article by my favorite author, Kevin Kelly, on, uh, in the latest Wired edition. He talks about kind of artificial smartness instead of artificial intelligence. But if you think, think of the history of AI, so this is a, a graph called Gartner's Hype Cycle. So most technologies, when they come, they go through these kind of stages. So per, first you have a technology trigger, like a new, some madman invents something. Then you go at the peak of inflated expectations. Wow, meta glasses, we can use them for everything. Uh, or like AI. Uh, so it's going to solve everything. It's going to be the spaceship controller and it's going to make things. Uh, then it doesn't really perform because as you saw before, the, the graph of exponential technology goes like this, right? And then it delivers. So right now our AI has been through this kind of what is called AI winter, which is a um, term like 10 years, like in the 90s, uh, 2000s, there have been sort of growth of disillusionments. People, they, it hasn't really delivered, right? So. And then now all of a sudden it's slow on and life and now things are actually happening and it, we're keeping on saying no, that's not intelligent. So chess player like Gaspar was beaten in 97 by Big Blue. Deep Blue. And we said like no, he, that was just not artificial intelligence, that's just, just some kind of algorithm. And then IBM Watson in 2011 uh, was beating uh, the world championship in uh, Jeopardy. And we said no, no, that's just not uh, really intelligence. That's not conscious, it's not conscious, right? But so there's a lot of things happening in artificial intelligence, and right now, these are really big impact. Right now, it's, it's really coming. And what they've done in the IBM's Watson is that they've made natural language processing, so they can actually interpret a uh, corpus of data, like Wikipedia. So you throw Wikipedia to it, and you can ask them what, what year was this uh, person born, and it will spit it back out. So it's kind of like interactive, you can talk to it, and you can write questions to it, yeah? yeah. But isn't the, the Turing test like the base of intelligence? Yeah, yeah. true. And that was beaten now <laughs> by, they actually, they, they kind of, some people said that they fooled the, so it's again, we're saying, no, that's not really intelligent. So, so the Turing test is like the test, 
to see if something is intelligent. So you have a jury of humans trying to ask, ask it questions and then you can respond and see if, you're, if it's intelligent or not. And, and it was exactly on the margin. So by saying that it was a uh, Ukrainian who didn't speak so good uh, English and uh, kind of was in the 30 years old. And, and in that case, you would think that it was actually real. But, but so these, these things are happening. And um, Watson is quite interesting because it's, uh, it's, it has a lot of potential in, in uh, diagnosis of healthcare. So if you give it the whole corpus of what's, what's been uh, diagnosis, it will kind of help you predict uh, and diagnose. So, yeah? Are you familiar if there's any open source version of Watson or if there is anyone working on something like that? There's an API now. They're encouraging a uh, third party ecosystem to build apps on it. <coughs> I think they'll take their cut of your revenue, but they, you can access it, uh, you can apply. They have a big funding also for companies built on Watson. So they have like, I think it was $1 billion uh, fund or something for startups. They, they, quite a lot of money for, 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 for that. And it's super interesting because like there, there's uh, one, they're using it's it for It's not the full API though, just, it, it's a part of it. Okay. But it's pretty cool still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you tried it? Yes. Okay, cool. Great. How did you get access to it? Uh, they had some, I don't, I don't recall, it was a, a tiny test. But okay, yeah. great. Yeah, we had it also, I think, in other universe. They came and gave us a try on it. And, and, and so You write apps that use it, so you give it a corpus of data or text, and then you can ask questions around that. And it's, um, it's been used for, uh, very successfully in diagnosing lung cancer. So they're trying it out now, and the medical personnel says that 90% of the cases it's right. That's pretty impressive. I mean, and, and that has big implications for how healthcare is going to look in the future, right? And it's going to become a big opportunity right now for doing knowledge transfer, like knowledge management. So, like to transfer this knowledge that we have inside the companies, and, and so into artificial intelligence, so that you can scale it. So, companies that already have a knowledge management culture that writes down the learnings in, in some kind of data form or something. If you can transport that and transfer that into AI, you, you can scale the organization quite quite well. You can you can make better decisions. So there's a, there's a whole blue water there, I would say, uh, to blue ocean there to to dive into. So why is this happening right now? So part of that is because uh, we have uh, cheap access to parallel processing. Like GPU is essentially a um, CPUs are doing things in, in uh, sequentially, but we're now developing new architectures of hardware which is highly parallelized, so they can do things like uh, more similar to what a brain, how a brain does. So this is an architecture from IBM which is inspired by the brain, so it's a, it's a highly parallelized system. It can essentially set up like neurons in the brain that, and that it can do like kind of cognitive tasks and then so. But don't worry, it's, it's still just one million neurons, so it's essentially the same on the level of a cockroach. So uh, a cockroach has about one million neurons, so. But eventually it's going to take off, I guess. This is an example of a VPU, a new kind of uh, processor for imaging. Uh, VPU is a new concept called, uh, it's a visual processing unit. It can take input uh, like uh, images and produce uh, a lot of data out of that and do image recognition uh, in real time. So these kind of things are, are, are happening. And then the second part of the why artificial intelligence will happen now is that uh, we get a lot of big data. We, everything becomes intelligent. So everything will have an RFID chip and, and you can track it. So that means you can do new things. And, and yeah, Hannes already has one in his arm. So mm -hmm. he's now intelligent. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> sort of, he's, a, he's part of the Internet of Things. Um, and you have Wikipedia, which is like a corpus of knowledge that people have been already writing, right? So you give that to an AI and they, it already has a basic set of knowledge now. And this helps for schooling and, and training the AI. And the third part of why AI is coming right now is that it's better algorithms. We have deep learning networks, like networks that are stacked, that can understand things more like a brain does. So there's also a software model on the brain. Uh, and this is kind of a, on the picture there to the right, that's actually how, that's the memory of a cat. That's an AI's memory of a cat. That's how, if you scan the whole internet, you find these kind of patterns, the memories of the, the AI. So it's kind of like recognizes that there's a lot of cats on online. That's a, that's a, that's a memory of a human, I guess. But, uh, yeah. And uh, as you might know, we are also developing uh, something like AI. I wouldn't, yeah, it's, it's like personal assistant, right? We're starting to speak with our mobile phones, like Cortana is this voice assistant. 
they're a narrow the personal assistant. They're narrow on to in the sense that they're they're doing a specific task. They can book uh, book you travel, or they can kind of uh, do you something. And then this is a whole uh, new wave of application. So and um, this is uh, one of the differentiators. There's a lot of AIs out there, I guess. So now in our Cortana, you can actually teach it. So you can uh, tell it what kind of person you are and, and what you like to do in the evening, and, and so and. Um, that's pretty cool because then that gives it basic set of how it can be more personal with you. So most other companies like Microsoft, Apple, Google has their Google Now, and uh, Amazon just launched their Amazon Echo, which is this uh, thing that you put in your home and then you speak to it. Uh, that's a really funny viral video around that one. That's mistakes. <laughs> so have you seen it? Yeah. So uh, obviously a lot of mistakes going to be done, and, and, and it's 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 a little bit like if you think about the good enough curve again, like it's 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 kind of like yeah, if you're a native English speaker, maybe it's easier. Uh, in Finland, I think it's never going to be <laughs> sort of <laughs> native Finnish, but but uh, but uh, it's a very difficult language to learn, by the way. Uh, but it's it's like it's coming, in and, and 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 if you interpolate it, it's it's probably one very interesting way of interacting. And uh, artificial intelligence is also interesting because they're driven by uh, by network effect, so you will have probably two or three players that can can do this in in the world. Hopefully, one of them will be open source or, or, or so. Or I don't know. But this is also an example of, of uh, AI intelligence or smartness. Uh, Foursquare like knows me, knows that I like vegetarian food and Japanese food, and, and then it recommends me places around. So these we already know. We've seen this a lot. Like Spotify has recommendations, etc. But we don't think of it as AI. But but essentially it is. Like when you when you start looking into it, uh, Amazon has this A A9, which is uh, pretty good at guessing that I'm like sailing and, and uh, chocolate. So it's it's pretty amazing actually. Like the more and the more data it gets, the the, the more more better it will be. Uh, at uh, the standard joke at Singularity University was like, if you don't have a good product, just sprinkle a little bit of AI over it. So that's kind of like essentially that's where it's going, right? So uh, you could see a whole new wave of ten thousand new startups becoming like we do this, but with AI. And actually, like it's true, it's probably going to be like that because it's going to be be everywhere, and the technology is there for it now. You can think of insurance companies being disrupted by this, and you can think of grocery shopping or, or things like that being having big impact on it. Robots. I'm not going to talk too much about robots, but like in healthcare, there's going to be probably a lot of stuff happening with robots and, and to help patients and so on. And, and this is a fellow robot. It's a company from Singularity University that does a robot that kind of drives around and helps you in the in the retail situations. With, uh, it's called Oshobot. So, uh, yes, the robots are coming, <laughs> but don't worry, they just have the intelligence of a cockroach. So that's it, pretty much. I've talked about the changing due to digitalization, exponentials, how you can spot the different, different changes, and we've specifically looked at cameras, and then we've also looked at some future trends. So, do you have any questions? I was, that was it. Yes, over there. Uh, no, just for this AI, that you get recommendations based on what I like, that we see everywhere. Yeah. I'm just thinking about the fact that how you form your choices and how do I, why do I like what I like. It's kind of based also that I'm kind of sometimes forced to try things and see things I didn't pick. Yeah. How does that work with the AI and how do you kind of um, think about this in the future, so you don't get like a funnel. Yeah, exactly. Where you How get you can... like people very yeah. much in isolated kind of different directions. Yeah, yeah. Being very kind of narrow-minded. I could see that becoming an art form. Uh, like that's an artistic thing, almost like an anthropologist would do that, right? Sort of like how do you how do you form this kind of like what what is the What's the significance of, of uh, when a person shifts music uh, taste, or like what, why, like how do you get recommendations that are relevant? I, I think Netflix had uh, a competition. They did some kind of competition where you hack the, like, create an algorithm that could give you better recommendations on TV series, and then they they increased that with the X percent, and then uh, so this it's algorithms, right? But it's like I think it needs. Um, it probably needs curation. Like I think it needs human curation. The thing is that an AI is good to a certain degree, but it's it's um, for example, it beats Kasparov in chess. But when Kasparov plays together with an AI, it will beat the AI. So you would always have a situation probably where you have an AI and a human. And if you can curate playlists on on Spotify, for example, based on your recommendation, 
but with some curation of a human that a, like a DJ could maybe kind of come in and, and help you out or, or things. Yeah, because it kind of feels like you want to get that kind of joker in yeah. the game. Well, totally. Because that's how you kind of develop, and uh, like yeah. tonight, I wasn't supposed to be here. <laughs> uh, I find it super interesting, uh, but I think sometimes you need to kind of just end up with places, and I think that's the same in, yeah. in life. You have some people, you know, they only do the same things and listen to the same things. Yeah. Kind of and I think it's uh, quite far away to get that right. I mean, we see uh, it's, it's still very challenging, and I think that's not because of technology. I think it's like Partly data, yeah, like if you'd have full knowledge of where you have been or like previously what has, maybe if you could measure what you really like when something random handed, happened and so like maybe there are algorithms for that but we are to find out, I, I don't know, maybe there's still a kind of a mystery of our brain that we cannot solve, maybe it's something that humans will always curate and like... Because like we need to be kind of aware about those questions, so mm. we're going to build it into the system of algorithms, so yeah. we don't create like... Uh, something that will make us too stupid. Mm. And my personal feeling from this recommendation is that a lot of algorithms can recommend you very good things, but uh, it's also like when you get a personal recommendation, it's also sort of the place you were in, that situation, that alien environment, when that person gave you that idea of going to somewhere. Like this kind of feeling of, wow, ah, what is that? Or like, you, you, maybe a met metadata around the pointer to your information that is uh, sometimes lacking. Because it could just be, if you think about music, it could just be a playlist of good music. But if you don't have the kind of situation awareness of, like, if you have that song recommended to you when you were in, in, in Bali, then you would probably take it to you and associate it to that. And, and I think it's very, very difficult uh, and get it right digitally. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any insights from Singularity University about the exponential growth in the food industry? Um, basically, alternative uh, for uh, the meat and dairy industry. Yeah, there was one um, company last year that did. Uh, they're called uh, uh, In Vitro, I think. And then uh, there's a. You know, part of the company. So we had a meeting. I actually met with. Uh, I, I'm super <coughs> interested in that myself. Uh, it's it's a, there's a company called Modern Meadow, which are quite far come. Um, but they pivoted from doing in vitro meat to uh, doing uh, actually leather because they felt that the market is difficult to go in in meat because there's because a lot of taboos. Uh, supermarkets and no taboos, personal tastes and stuff. Difficult uh, people when you're eating something, it's a very strong thing of eating something. And, and so they actually went into sort of said, you know, we're going to do, um, they did what Tesla was doing, same with the, with the car, I think it's very interesting. Tesla went in and like, many, many, many car uh, producers have tried to do something, an uh, electric car, and then uh, they were always a little bit worse, so people wouldn't really switch, because they were not as good, right? And then Tesla went in and said, we're going to do something that is better, and that's why people are switching now to electric cars with Tesla, uh, because they have this kind of association of that it's a good thing. Same with what they're doing now with with um, leather, that uh, they're doing a superior product of leather, uh, uh, artificially produced leather, or like grown leather. Uh, non -an it's animal, but it's not grown on a living bee. But, but once the uh, uh, superior product also reaches uh, uh, food products, yeah, that's when you can, can convince the population to make the switch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think... Um, they first want to proof case it with leather and get get sort of uh, stable there. I they have had they have chips like they have. Um, I didn't try them, but they have this um, uh, artificially or in vitro grown meat that they're doing into kind of chips. They're like uh, like beef jerky or something like that that you chew and with barbecue flavor and different flavors and wow, stuff. So the company's title. Okay, again, uh, in vitro grown meat. Yes. You take stem cells and grow it artificially. And I don't know if it's stem cells. Um, uh, yeah, they make burgers. Out of it. Yeah, they have made burgers as well. There's another company that has done a real burger that was on the news. Steak. Steak, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he's coming to Sweden next. Me and my friends are organizing a, a scientific conference, kind of, and not okay. okay. And that guy, Mark Post, is coming. So from Modern Meadow or from the. No, from the. He's in. Dutch scientist, okay, yeah. and he, he made the, the prototype for the, the burger, basically. Cool. 
the $250,000 program. <laughs> yeah, that's the <laughs> program. Can I answer that? You're a high school kid. Yeah, I'm food in the environment because in the sustainability world we're working a lot with the food companies and I mean the, the in vitro thing is it's I mean people want to eat meat basically but it's you know it's not very healthy and so on so there's other products coming made of soy that will be much more sustainable and energy efficient and cheap which is basically would taste exactly the same thing it's already on the market it's just need a you know, the tipping point I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of, we're working in the same... Uh, I'm not sure that's something yeah, to say yeah, about that. Uh, we're work, working with different types of uh, words. Uh, yeah. It's not technology, it's sustainability. But it's a, basically, we have a lot of similar... Um, Are you working with that word? Yeah, 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 well, I work with Ikea, for example. Ikea. Okay. Yeah, and I work with Axe Food. And I mean, everybody's talking about how we can make the, you know, the vegetarian, the next uh, thing. Everybody's working with the... Eco food is growing super much here in Sweden. Yeah. So, and um, you should meat, talk to meat consumption is. Hannes is uh, doing. Yeah. I'm doing a project though for if you want a growing exponential food, you should go for uh, that which reproduces exponentially, and that is insects. So, if someone wants to discuss. <laughs> yeah. Can I finish? Yeah. Can I just answer? Because we, uh, I'm working uh, with a company called Beat Food for Progress, and they're making basically the, the, the hybrid car of food, which is if they have a, uh, a, meat a bean meat, meat mixed meat. with the actual meat to make people yeah. actually that are loving, the meat lovers, trying to make them eat 50% vegetarian or vegan actually. And they don't make the. Well, isn't that sausage the, already? Like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't know what this. It's not meat. Burger meat. But it's. It, I mean, it's just to make people shift. It's not the same with the yeah. hard lovers. Right. They yeah. need to have the hybrid car before they can actually right. go into the Teslas. Yeah. So, yeah. These things like you could explain to them. So, are there any notifications? Yeah, yeah. We we Is wrote a uh, report that's called Sustainable Food for All, and that's about sustainability and health combined, and what we're supposed to eat in the future. Can you read that? And it's uh, all about health, of course. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm really interested in um, uh, mycelium protein, myself. Mm -hmm. Like, corn is really Yeah, yeah. but that's have, have uh, eggs in them. They, so yeah, yeah, that's true. So it's better than insects. <laughs> And they have already, like, there's crickets. Depending on what borders, yeah. Oh, okay. Depends on where you come from. This is more of a personal question, but what do you personally think is going to be the next disruptive technology? 3D printing, whether we're going to have a 3D printer and whatever we want printed at home, like all technology and everything, or something else? I think uh, AI is, like, yeah. the things that I talked about now, I think the, the, the combination of AI, uh, like, or if you, if you, I, I'm, I'm in mobile industry, so, so if, if I take that one, like augmented reality uh, together with voice commands and, and the sort of like better interfaces, I think it's interesting. Uh, that will make the phone where the PC is now. Maybe you have one, but maybe you leave it home because you can do most of the things with sort of uh, without it, so with wearables. Um, otherwise, so I'm, I'm in that area, so I'm kind of, uh, sort of, I think, think a lot about that. Um, I, I think 3D printing is cool. Uh, I don't know exactly how it's going to look like. It's hard to say. I mean, I've seen some really convincing examples and so on. I think the, the whole idea behind it is, is uh, amazing. I mean, it's totally demonetizes things and, and sharing. Is, uh, so, I don't know. Uh, eventually, maybe things become vir virtual anyway, so like, uh, <laughs> Maybe you don't need to print them, sort of like, but digital. Um, I don't know. I think electric car is really cool as well, like the super disruptive as well. Solar panels. Solar panels are really coming. Uh, super exciting for for saving the power problems. The, the thing you're saying is really interesting because, uh, as you said, uh, we're not looking linearly. We're looking exponentially. And I was at like the JRI, the Japanese Research Institute. And they have like just big rooms of all of these technologies in one. 
and those the things they're doing there are not what we're looking at. Like as you say, you, you the think, Japanese, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah but yeah, like the, the whole room was like uh, you, you could just wear sleeves of uh, of uh, augmented augmented reality and like pick things in the air just by having yeah. have, having like Oculus Rift glasses or augmented reality glasses yeah. on, and you can use it and you can write in in the air everything. So that will disrupt much more than. We, we think, yeah, like, and that and that's why it's so hard to predict actually what we think is going to happen. Yeah, because when we when, when we look at those things, that and that's not what the typical or the consensus is of where we're going right now. So it's going to be very different. But yeah, as you say, you can't act, and it's very difficult to, to yeah. predict somehow. There's not one future. There's many no, many views of it. Yeah. Like, but, but I think it's it's uh, yeah. I think this is super interesting. The, the whole yeah. thing of displays and, and things where where things are going. If it's like uh, or like uh, actually, I'm, I'm one thing that I haven't talked about because last time I did it, uh, people thought I was a freak. So uh, yeah. no, but like the the, the brain interfaces. That's, yeah, that's super interesting. So that's what we tried. Um, oh, you tried? So yeah, the like, EEG then. Yeah, the EEG and like if you. Like you have the electronic mantles on your arms and up the sleeve, so you have it. You have it like this. Somehow it it connects in an interface with the brain, and the information mm. comes there. So if you just raise your arm, you can build things. Yeah, and like that that goes to printers, and you can just build things uh, like in in midair. Yeah, and just leave it there because there's no gravity, it's it's virtual reality. Yeah, and they will then co copy that room. So there's are <laughs> rooms that then reproduce rooms. Yeah, so that's why like. Uh, I yeah, this is super cool. Stuff. The things that are coming are not like, like the consensus is right now. Yeah, it will be very disruptive. And this whole thing of like just, uh, I mean, when you think the extension of like brain interfaces, it's like first now they are in EEG state, kind of like or like you could also have some interface which kind of reads what you're about to say, like it's connected to your voice, yeah. sort of. Which, uh, but but in the end, uh, they've started now doing really cool stuff with mice, like they're uh, connecting mouse brains uh, with each other, so you can actually. Uh, have mouses solve a thing over the internet, so they they can uh, they have a quest for getting food, and they have like eight mices, uh, mice, mouse, mouses, mice, uh, and they they sort of yeah. mice. So they solve it together by sending brain waves to each other over internet. Um, they're directly operated in, in their brain. So, but it's, it's quite intrusive. So, like, uh, I know Hannes will be the first one to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that there's also this, uh, this one thing that I I found super exciting is this optogenetics. Yeah. Optogenetics is this uh, technology which is like genetic things that you eat, a pill essentially that can transform your DNA. And go in and change your neurons, so the neurons on your brain becomes uh, sensitive to light, which means that you can stimulate actually non-intrusive. So you can you can actually get light through your skull, like uh, like without going into the brain. So you can light it through, and then you'd have uh, by by stimulating it with pulses, you would have essentially like uh, eyes in your your brain, so like the uh, photon sensitivity of your in your brain. That means you could write straight into the brain. It's like the next level of virtual reality. So. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Okay, it's me. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, because I think it's so interesting with the singularity university thing, uh, but you're looking, you had the, the graph with the linear growth and the exponential growth, but do you, do you have circular? Circular? Do you think in a circular way? Because as a sustainability future, so I was thinking, do you talk about circular? That's very hard to draw that, uh, that graph, mathematically. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, I mean, for, for me, you're talking about yeah, software, so that's yeah. fine, but when you're talking about ha hardware, it's not sustainable to have like exponential growth, because you have to have a circular way of recycling things, or yeah. upcycling, or, you know, you but put it's it very sustainable. With, with, I mean, when things are virtual, you'll have probably virtual environmentalists, I guess, they don't want you to clutter down their beautiful uh, digital data, uh, but uh, that's pretty sustainable, I would think. Or like, like when yeah, things are not visible. You're talking about 3D printers. You have to get the, you know, the way you design things into an uh, uh, ecosystem, basically. So yeah. you can actually, you know, put it in the design phase that you're <coughs> gonna have to use the product again, not only throw it away and uh, yeah, or burn it. You have to make it into a new thing, right? Yeah, Google. Is it the Google Aura project or is it the Tango? I always mix them up. One of their research projects uh, is building a modular phone, which you can snap on magnetically. You can take out pieces and then put in another, so you can upgrade the camera and, and you can kind of... And it, they just published a week ago, like a 
first prototype from it. So it's pretty cool. That's that's really I think sustainable in a way that you don't have to upgrade the whole thing. You can just change the CPU and then you keep on updating new memories and so like you did with the pieces in the like yeah, but that you're still doing with pieces. But it's the same with TV. You can upgrade as well. Like any premium stuff you don't throw away you put the chip upgrade. Yeah. Oh yeah, they also have this kind of modular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not picking up yet, but yeah, you can do that. Yeah, I think the sustainability aspect in technological development is definitely lagging behind a lot. Just like you say, with three D printing is just one of the example because now we're democratizing it, but that also means that we're producing us so much more plastic than we would have otherwise probably. Uh, at the same time, it's coming. For example, one of the um, one of these companies, three D Systems, is, is working on a recyclable. So they're they're using filaments that's recycled plastic, but that's still twenty five percent recycled and seventy five percent new. Uh, and that also has to do with the material integrity. But it's the point is that it's lagging behind a lot. It's it's catching up, but very very much behind. All right. Right. So uh, thanks, Marcus. This was a very interesting conversation, wonderful speech. I have a lot of things to think about. Uh, <laughs> let's continue and hang out here for a few more minutes if you like. Uh, have, uh, have some water or a cider or whatever suits you and uh, we can stick around and uh, have a smaller type conversation. Those who need to go, <coughs> free to go. But, uh,